Hi, everybody. Welcome to Radio 815. This is episode 82 of the podcast dedicated to examining the works of writer, director, producer J.J. Abrams and the extended Bad Robot universe. I am Matt Crandall here, as always, with my co host, Marcelo Inestroza, as we continue taking a look at Fringe season one. Today, we are going to be talking about episodes eight and nine. First up is episode eight, The Equation. Written by J.R. Orsi and David H. Goodman, directed by Gwyneth Horder Payton. It aired November 18th, 2008. Marcelo, do you want to play a game of red light, green light? No, I don't. I don't know. There was something about this episode that didn't necessarily vibe with me. I really liked the opening sequence with the father and the son driving on the highway and then the young woman. Uh, appearing to have car trouble on the side of the road, the father jumping out of his car to help her fix her engine. And all of a sudden you see those, you see the red light and the green lights and those red lights and green lights, you know, caused the father to get hypnotized. I didn't like the kidnapping angle, but I did like uh, why the bad guys in this episode kidnapped the kid. The formula that they needed to crack to do something was really, really entertaining, I thought. But for the most part, I, di- I didn't like the kid in this episode. I didn't, yeah, th- I don't know. I just, this episode didn't fly, didn't didn't play well for me. I thought it was okay. And speaking of the kid, the kid would grow up to become Wyatt on Ozark, who was one of my favorite characters on one of my favorite shows. So seeing him as an eight-year-old, I was like, holy shit, that's Wyatt. He's alive and well at eight years old or whatever. But, um, and obviously Gillian Jacobs as the kidnapper from Community and so many other great shows. So I love the the cast. My favorite part of rewatching Fringe is seeing all the people who are now much more famous than they were when they guessed it on Fringe. But in terms of the overall story of, I'm interested in these lights that can hypnotize people and Walter later explains that, you know, some people were trying to use this technology to embed it into commercials. And he's like, but the side effect was it made everyone feel sick and they didn't realize nobody wants to buy stuff if they're throwing up. And so I thought that was really interesting. And that was kind of a uh, Halloween three season of the witch type of idea. And that was cool. But overall, this whole mystery of the kidnapping and even Walter visiting his old friend at the mental institution to try and figure out this equation. So I did like the parts I liked is Walter returning there and having to deal with the baggage of a place that is so familiar to him that we don't want to see him fit back in. But the fact that this kid can play music that can solve this magic equation And Walter's friend can literally just solve like the math equation to get the same result was an interesting parallel, but I thought it didn't really come together in a way. And a lot of the St. Clair's hospital stuff, I wanted more meat to see what it's like for Walter to be back in that setting without the way that they kind of took it. So I wasn't too much of a fan of his interactions with his fellow co his friend or whatever, and how that all played out. So I thought the main mystery of the week was the weakest part of the episode, for sure. And it was just the smaller Olivia, Peter, Walter moments that were more entertaining. But the, you know, we see the guy, Mitchell Loeb from last week, who is now alive, well, and completely evil. We do catch up with him in a scene where we figure out, like, what they they are kind of trying to do with this whole plan of theirs and you know his thing with the fruit so i i thought there were lots of like easter eggs and breadcrumbs that they're teasing out something more interesting than what is actually happening in this episode not being as compelling with walter having to go back to saint Clair's, i really liked needing walter to Not to say that Walter hasn't contributed to the team, but having Walter contribute to the team in a different way, I thought was very, very interesting. And I did not like 
uh, Walter's doctor, the, the doctor that took care of him at St. Clair's. I don't believe that on my side of the world, doctors take care of mental patients particularly well. I think that they just lock them up in rooms and they medicate them so they won't feel any pain, but they don't really fix any of their problems. So basically, I think they use medication to lock them inside of their own heads. When Olivia comes to him to give the team access to Walter's colleague is, is such bull crap. I don't like the way that they treat people with mental disabilities in this country. And as a result, I don't like the way that um, they're necessarily portrayed in modern in modern entertainment. I didn't ha I didn't have a problem with it in this episode so much because I love Fringe. But still, when Walter goes to talk to his friend, his friend loses it at, at a point in the conversation. And then Walter gets drugged. And then the doctor says that Walter isn't healed, so he can't leave. So Peter and Olivia spend a, uh, a couple scenes trying to get Walter out of the institution. And that bullshit just terrified the shit out of me. It played to me as the doctor didn't want to help Walter. The doctor just wanted Walter back in the institution for whatever reason. He wanted to get, he wanted to get revenge on him for something or whatever. And, you know, it's just based on what the doctor says when Olivia comes to him the first time. And he says that Walter Bishop shouldn't be among regular people. And as we get to know him, as the series goes along, we understand why, but still, that's something really crappy to say about your your own patients. Isn't your job as a doctor to help people and not and not to lock them up and throw away the key? This guy was like a petty piece of crap. And finding out that, you know, Walter going back to visit and even Peter saying, like, I got this. And the guy basically just wanting to put Walter back into that role of crazy guy that we have to just lock up was super frustrating and you're right the way that this is depicted I don't have a problem with it but it just goes to show the problem is a greater problem with the system and so that definitely was one of those upsetting moments when Walter part of us were just like Walter calm down like please don't have an episode here cuz we know that this the guy who runs St. Clair's has it out for him and Luckily, that does lead to one of the weirdest scenes of this episode, which is where Walter does get locked up, and then he is visited by Walter? What are you thinking when uh, a much well-off-looking Walter comes and sits on the edge of his bed? Is this some sort of hallucination, or what's going on here? At first, I, I chalked it up as a hallucination because... Before he was interned in his old cell, to to make him seem docile, they drugged him in the uh, in the you know you know in the common area. So at first, I thought that it was just a hallucination of Walter reacting to his surroundings. But on further inspection, I was like, "Wait a minute, is that no? It can't be. It's it's a little bit too early for that." I would chalk it up to a hallucination. But if you have some inkling of where we're going. I wouldn't be mad at you if you thought it was somebody else. Yeah, I definitely felt it was hallucination and him kind of, I almost thought it was like the him that was outside of St. Clair's consoling the him now that he's back in St. Clair's, like the old version of him. So it was definitely something where I'm like, that's my initial thought. So who knows what's actually happening here? I've been thinking lots of weird things as we're watching and even this episode itself when the boy gets kidnapped and Britta is doing all the stuff to him to try and get him to play out the equation in the musical form he sees his dead mom there's already something weird happening in this episode with people who are not really there and we're not even sure at first is his mother alive what's going on until near the end we kind of get a sense that it's all some sort of trickery that that is drummed up with this technology 
But I think that that makes that Walter scene, it makes me question the legitimacy of any of it because we already have in this episode something else that I know is mostly impossible is this kid seeing his dead mom. And it doesn't feel like the exact same as the John Scott visions that Olivia is having, but there are similar weird elements to it going on. So I thought that as a whole was interesting and made me think that every time you're watching fringe, you've got to question what is real and what is not. But even the stuff that might not be real still could actually be happening in some capacity and still be important to the plot. One thing that I found very interesting in this episode, and the reason why I say interesting is because when this character was first introduced into the show, he was very reluctant to be with his father, to be the caretaker of his father. But Peter's behavior when his father gets locked up in St. Clair's really, really shows me that in in the small time that the French team has been together, Peter has learned how to care for his father. If this would have happened to Walter early on, I doubt that Peter would have lifted two fingers to get his father out of the mental out of the mental institution. And it was really, I really, really love those scenes when Peter squared off with the with the with the asshole uh, doctor to try and understand why Walter was in the institution. We've seen it in countless other episodes that we've covered in the past weeks here, but I thought it would have happened more gradually. I, I didn't think it would happen this quick. Yeah, I think it was because it was such a dire, severe situation, but it's kind of like the thing where, like, you know, you can be exhausted of your family, but if somebody says your family looks exhausted, you're like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I can say that, but you can't say that. So when this guy... Peter, even though Walter is a lot and he certainly this is not his ideal situation to have to look out for his dad this way. But when push comes to shove, they are family. And if somebody is treating him in a poor way or misjudging a situation, then Peter's going to step in and stand up for for his dad. So I thought that was really good. And what's interesting is that that happens. But then by the end of the episode, Walter says that he actually wants his own place so he's kind of ready to have a little bit more independence so i thought it was interesting that we have walter take a step back peter step up so i thought in terms of those characters there were a lot of developments in this episode for their arcs together and apart now what are you thinking in that almost final scene where we've got this weird safe and an apple and all this stuff that's going on. What, what do you think this is? The fuck is happening? Why, why was this equation worth kidnapping and doing all this stuff that they had to do to get whatever this machine back in the day, when I first saw this episode and when we come to the part of the episode where, um, we see the apple in the safe. I was thinking, what the hell is this? And as the scene goes on, when when the agent placed the apple in the safe and he punches in the code that the boy was working on, I'm like, the hell is he doing? Like, he's not obviously trying to break into the safe because he just opens. So what the hell is he trying to do? But when he puts that piece of cloth over the safe and then it starts vibrating once he puts in the code, I'm like, holy shit, he's going to stick his hand through it, isn't he? And I was like, oh my God. I'm like, what What could this be? Like, who could this be for? In hindsight, I do know where we're going with this, so I won't spoil with that. I won't spoil where we're going with it, but the first time I saw it, I was floored, and I was like, what could this be used for in the future? I was really, really pleased with the I was really pleased with the way that they used the equation that they were after. It didn't make sense to me back in the day, but now seeing the show multiple times, I just love when the scene comes up because I can't, you know, the, the things that this scene sets up for later on are spectacular. Yeah, this is the start of something much bigger than it seems in the moment. 
And before we move on, I'll just mention that obviously we give the shout outs of when the observer is seen and there's a, a scene where Olivia and Charlie are out looking for the kid and you can see the observer. The cipher in this episode spells out T-A-K-E-N, Taken, which obviously goes to the kidnapping plot. And that will bring us to episode nine, The Dreamscape, which aired November 25th, 2008, written by Zach Whedon and Julia Cho, directed by Frederick E.O. Toy. The opening to this episode I thought was outstanding because it's this guy who's late for a meeting. He comes and does the meeting, and after the meeting is over, the people that he was doing the presentation for are very, very happy. So he's packing up, getting ready to leave, and this butterfly from out of nowhere comes and lands on his hand, and all of a sudden, the butterfly swipes at him and cuts him deep. And I'm like, I, I, okay, I'm like, at that point, I'm like, guy, why don't you just kill the butterfly and get out of the office? But this guy does the in th- this guy does the unthinkable and goes to a grate where he hears a noise and tons of these butterflies fly up from the grate. I thought that that was really, really well done because at the time I'm like, these are really cool special effects. And I thought that this guy was really getting attacked by butterflies. But when he falls to his death, the camera pulls back and we see what building he was in. And I was like, this motherfucker worked for Massive Dynamic. I was like, I knew it. This episode is going to make me happy, but it's going to piss me off. So I love this episode because of the way that it handled the butterflies. Because on one hand, I thought that they were real. But once we find out what is really happening with these butterflies, I thought that was fascinating. I do like that opening scene where, you know, this guy's late for this meeting. And I'm like, okay, something's going to go wrong here. or Something's going to go weird. But I didn't think it was going to be like the attack of the magical butterflies. And so as that's playing out, I'm like, okay, fine. But Supernatural tried to do a bug episode and like bugs are not as scary as like they're trying to do almost like a Hitchcock's The Birds homage within this office building. But then the guy jumps out the window and I'm getting like Watchmen vibes from the the big opening scene of Watchmen. And then as he hits the, the roof of the car and, you know, tragic death and the camera dollies back. And when it does show us that this building is massive dynamic, I was like, OK, now I actually like this opening <laughs> because at first I was like, yeah, I feel like I've seen this a million times in other things. So I thought that was that was really good. And what I like also about this is that the main through line of this episode again, revisits a lot of the things that we have established previous, but expands them. So over the course of the episode, Olivia has to go into the memories of John Scott. And she gets back in the tank. And so we see her back in the tank. And there's a moment where she's about to get into the tank. And Walter, he goes, I just got an erection. and. Then he says, like, it's not because you're you're undressed or anything. And Olivia's like, well, that's good to know. And it's like, oh, Walter, you crazy so-and-so. That would have you fired immediately. But uh, so I love that Olivia goes in. And as she goes in and is revisiting this memory of John Scott at a restaurant, she keeps thinking, like, I can reach out to him. I can I can get this information that we need. And Walter keeps saying, like, it's a memory. If it didn't happen, it doesn't happen. You can't change it. You're just revisiting the memories. And so I like that she sees certain scenes that we need the information. But, you know, two guys that she needs to follow walk away and she can't follow them because John didn't follow them. So throughout the episode, we do get those few moments where she's in his memories. And it is all stemming off the tank technology that we've established before. And it's because we're trying to find out in this episode, they say what you have basically been saying. Massive dynamic is attached to all of this shit. It shouldn't that raise our red flag. But by the end of the episode, someone explicitly says, and I'm jumping a bit ahead, but we we aren't, we never go in chronological order here. The guy says, 
don't you think it's fucked up that it's always massive dynamic? But also, don't you think it's fucked up that you always know that it's massive dynamic? And he's like, doesn't that seem like it's a little bit of, you know, we're making you play Simon Says so that we can rob a bank. Like, your attention is over here because Massive Dynamic wants it over here. So what is actually going on? So I thought that this episode really cracked open the thing that you have been saying where you're like, Massive Dynamic is pissing me off because they're so connected. And the character in this says, it's not a coincidence that Massive Dynamic is connected, but it's also not a coincidence that you know every time Massive Dynamic is involved because they are actually trying to get you to see what they're showing you so you're not seeing what's behind their back. And I thought that that was like one of those, ooh, and so that really opened up a new can of worms where now Olivia knows that they can't take any of this Massive Dynamic shit at face value at all because it could all be theater or it could just all be deception. So what are you thinking as by the end of the episode that that breaks out? I had completely forgot that there was going to be a point in this season where Olivia was going to start to question the culpability and the responsibility of massive dynamic. And when she did that in this episode, I was hooping and hollering. The thing about Massive Dynamic is I love the way that Olivia has conversations with Nina Sharp in this particular episode because her conversations with Nina Sharp in this episode are very hostile and they're very pointed. They're kind of misleading because she's being hostile, but she's being hostile very politely. It's like both of them know they're only doing this to play a game. I am really interested to meet William Bell, because that's a name that constantly comes up, but we will not meet William Bell for a couple more weeks. His name has popped up several times in this series. So were you thinking that William Bell was like the evil Elon Musk or the evil Jeff Bezos? Which is to say just an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos, I think. I think evil is implied. But uh, that is what I definitely thought, that there is some sort of... They keep mentioning him, so we know that he's like a mysterious figurehead who maybe has more sinister leanings than we know yet. So I think that because they keep him shrouded in mystery, we are still trying to figure out who this is, if he even really exists and what he's up to because we only see Nina Sharp as the head of Massive Dynamic but we know that she reports to someone else but we're still unsure what that actually means and what for what purpose so I do know obviously having seen the show that we're building up to an amazing William Bell reveal but even now you knew like okay when we finally get to this especially if Walter is like the mad scientist who went mad and William Bell is the mad scientist who got rich. I expect that if we got friggin' John Noble to play Walter, then we got to have someone with as much gravitas to be the evil side, the, the nefariously evil and rich power side of that coin. So I definitely think that even watching it back when it aired, I had expectations that like, all right, they're probably going to drag this William Bell in this shadowy figure until like the finale of the first season and have it be some sort of big reveal that they're going to get some sort of actor that I'm going to go, holy shit, can you believe that William Bell is X? Uh, So I definitely think that that was built into the way that they've been talking about him because if he showed up and it was just like some unknown, you know, New York actor who now shows up on billions, I would be pissed. <laughs> I would I would be kind of like let down. So I think that they have been building it up and this episode especially where they remind us, yeah, massive dynamic Nina Sharp, but don't forget William Bell. So I definitely think that that is part of this journey and I do like that a lot. Um, I will mention that, yeah, some of my favorite scenes are basically Olivia revisiting the memories and her trying to figure out what happened with John Scott. 
but also memories that maybe shouldn't be revisited. Peter's storyline is, <laughs> is one where he catches up with an old, we can assume like an old flame or an old friend or whatever. And it eventually leads to him beating the guy who he knows beat up his friend Tess and saying, if you ever touch her again, I'll fucking kill you. And that we know is bad news because Peter has people who are after him. He has debts. He has been a hustler in the past. We know that there is some sort of cloud around Peter Bishop. And rather than just keeping his head down and walking with his umbrella, he throws it away and steps right under the cloud and basically says, here I am. Because we do see some people saying Peter Bishop is back in town. And that seems like bad news. So that C storyline in this episode makes me worried for Peter's future and wondering where that is going to go and what kind of trouble non fringe massive dynamic related this guy is about to get into because he did, he did the right thing. You know, you don't want to stand by if you know that this person that you care about is being hurt by someone who hopefully you could cut out of their life. But it is just frustrating because Peter has been different since he's been with his dad. And we've been hoping that this past wouldn't catch up with him, but it definitely seems to be moving full steam ahead. What are you thinking of that? All I'm thinking throughout the entire throughout the entire plot playing out throughout this episode is is the guy after him or the guy, you know, uh, because he actually beats up the guy who is threatening his friend. And we see that guy later on talking to a black, talking to a white guy in a black coat. And I'm like, is that Big Eddie? I'm going to be honest with you. I completely forgot about the storyline. Look, I've seen Fringe a billion times, but for some reason, this storyline always seems to go in my head and go out the other ear the, the, the second that the episode is over. So I have no idea where we're going with this episode, but I found Peter's behavior to be a little odd because I'm like, okay, if people are chasing you and if people are threatening your friend, okay, that's one thing. Okay. I'm look, I'm not mad that he defended his friend. I would have defended my friend if I, you know, if I was able to help in that specific way. But if people are chasing me and if I don't want people to know that I'm here, why would I announce myself like this? Do you think that he was so concerned about his friend that he really threw caution to the wind and said, I don't care if everybody knows that I'm here. I just want to help my friend and I just want to get this off of her back. Yeah, I definitely think this is he was leading with his heart rather than his head in that moment. I think that Peter is a lot smarter than this and his behavior, you know, the way he handled this was very, very on Peter like the use of the tank. Again, I really like how when Olivia enters the tank for the second time, the director of this episode used completely different camera angles than the director of the pilot did. Because when she goes in the when she goes into the tank, you see her going into the tank from the side. But he still used that famous shot of her putting her head back into the liquid. That they also changed the um, the medical leads that they put on her that they put on her midsection. They they changed the medical leads. They aren't the same medical leads that they used in the uh, in the pilot. When Antor is sitting on the side of the tank. She's covered up. So I wonder, just I wonder, if the first time that Anator goes into the tank, Peter's there, Walter's there, everybody's there. And poor Anator is naked. And we can see her in her birthday suit, basically, almost in her birthday suit. But <laughs> this episode, she's covered up. So I'm like, so I'm thinking, okay, the producers must have, the producers must have thought, you know what? Let's not sell the show with sex anymore. Let's cover her up. So I thought that was I thought that was very odd because I'm like, the first time you guys put her in a tank, 
You almost had her in her birthday suit, and now you got a freaking blanket over her? Come on, dude. I think part of the difference could also be that they filmed the pilot in, like, May in Toronto. And I'm willing to bet that it was, like, a more of a, a logistical, I don't want to be sitting here for eight hours freezing my ass off. But I do love that in this episode, so, yeah, we go back to the tank, but we go back to the tank multiple times, and every time to make this work, Walter has to keep amping up the drugs. So there is a big through line where he's like, you know, nothing makes me happier than taking drugs. And he says, you know, perhaps giving them, designing them, carrying out experiments that bend the plane of existence. But I'm rarely opposed to such things except now. And he's like, because this is actually getting dangerous because these drugs that we have to use to make this still work anything can go wrong. And even as they're like amping up what they have to do, there's a part where Walter has a Bible and he's like, well, you're taking these psychedelics and you're lying in saline with an electrical charge. He's like, I'm just praying you don't get electrocuted. And Olivia's like, praise the Lord. Walter goes, amen. And I'm like, okay. So like, I just love that even as Walter still loves all these drugs and stuff, he is, starting to care for Olivia enough that he doesn't actually want to see something go wrong in the name of science. Whereas I feel like even eight episodes ago, he wouldn't have actually cared that much. It would have been a bummer for a minute if she had been electrocuted or if these drugs had warped her mind, but he's actually starting to care. And so when he says like, you know, a guy who believes in science carrying around a Bible is probably an odd sight to begin with. But he knows what's at stake, so that's why they they continue with the experiments. So I thought that was a nice little thing that they threw in there that shows us, yes, this is all about the drugs and the weird psychedelics that Walter loves. But there is some care and compassion building up between him and, and Dunham. The other thing that is very, very interesting, it's one line and it's very quick. And if you missed it, I'll forgive you. But when Olivia sees that Walter has the Bible, right? And she asks Walter, I didn't know you were a religious guy. And he goes, no, right? But he goes, he goes, no, but I used to be. So I'm like, huh, what stopped this guy from being a religious person? I found it really interesting that Walter, like you just said, is really caring, is really starting to care about Olivia Dunham. And he is really concerned about her safety. I found it to be very, very intriguing. And I found it to be very, very nice and unexpected. Because like you just said, in the pilot or in episode two, if if poor Livia would have, you know, turned into burnt toast in the tank, Walter, you know, would have been sad for maybe about 10 seconds and then would have wanted like a, would have wanted like a, a root beer float or something. But I really, I really like the fact that the writers of this episode said, I think it's a good idea to give the doctor who has no lines to finally give him a line that he's not willing to cross. And he sees that poor Olivia is at the end of a rope. I mean, she's seen John everywhere she's getting emails from him which i don't under, i don't understand how that works she is at the end of her rope and i think when walter says to her you need to get some sleep we we need to we need i need to devise another way for you to get into your subconscious so you can actually speak to john that is safer than putting you in the tank when Walter goes back into his hotel room and, and, and the camera focuses in on Anna Tor, she has such a, a, a look of disappointment and desperation on her face that just for a split second, I thought that she was going to go back to the lab and shoot herself up with something and put her own self in the tank. But for a split second, I thought that was going to happen. She's willing to go to these lengths to try and figure out what's up with, with John and, you mentioned the emails. So we do see that she's getting emails from John. And then at the end, she gets a new email that says, 
I saw you at the restaurant. So she was convinced that somehow she could change the memory. She could communicate in a way that wasn't passive. And the whole episode is people telling her that that's not possible. But then she gets that email at the very end that lets us know this is fucking fringe, guys. Mm -hmm. When she gets that, it opens up a whole new can of worms that this John Scott stuff has gone from weird to weirder to, oh, my God, ghost emails are showing up. Uh, What are you thinking as she reads this email? And we know that her interaction that was supposed to be her in a memory has somehow stuck. But we know that his body is in stasis somewhere on ice somewhere, you know, having information extracted from his brain somehow. But would it be so insane to think that somehow telepathically he could hack into the internet? At first, when Olivia started getting the emails, I thought that she was just hallucinating like our, like our friend who decided to go, uh, decided to jump out the window. I thought that the emails weren't real. I still don't think that the emails are real because how does a body on ice send his fiance for lack of a better point, because that was, that was what Olivia was going to be at some point. How does a person who is on ice, who is technically by all intents and purposes dead, send his girl, send his girlfriend emails. And how does a guy who is technically dead see his own girlfriend in his subconscious. That begs the question, maybe Walter doesn't really know how these subconscious visions really work. Maybe he has an idea, but maybe he doesn't know everything. Right, or maybe the amount of psychedelics that they have used have ramped up the process to some sort of new heights. But that is stuff we will have to find out as we go on deeper into Fringe. Uh, The housekeeping, the observer is seen when the guy gets off the elevator when he's late for the meeting. Right at the beginning, you can see the observer. The cipher spells out the word voice. And if you are a bad robot fan, there were a couple of bad robot Easter eggs. Um, The first is Olivia is on a phone call near the beginning of the episode. And she says, oh, Beth, yeah, the surprise party for Bobby. Now, this episode aired the same year that Cloverfield came out, which is all about a surprise party for Rob, who some people would call Bobby, and his best friend is Beth. So it is implied that possibly Olivia Dunham was maybe supposed to be at the party at the beginning of Cloverfield and just got too wrapped up in this shit to So I thought that was pretty intriguing. And when she's in uh, Mark Young's apartment, she finds a plane ticket and it's just very quickly seen. And there's not the logo that you would immediately recognize because ABC would have that trademarked. But it is for a flight on Oceanic Air that we see a, a plane ticket really quick. So that is also there for anybody who knows what the hell Oceanic Air is. And hopefully if you've been listening to this podcast, you know, but if you've only joined us for fringe, that's fine too. Next week, we are going to be talking about episodes 10 and 11 of the first season of fringe. So if you are watching along with us, that will be the episodes entitled safe and bound. So that's the homework. If you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, you can hit us up on Twitter at JJUniverse815 or tweet using the hashtag Radio815. If you like the show at all, please subscribe, follow, whatever it is, comment, rate. Let us know. If you want to reach out to me directly, I am on Twitter at Matt Crandall. Marcelo, Twitter's a good spot for the people to yell at you. I am at CreekFanatic88. So that'll do it. Thanks a lot for listening, guys. Until next week, Radio815. Over and out. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.